Good morning, everybody, um, or good afternoon, actually, where we are at. Um, my name is Cynthia Holt, and I'm the Executive Director of the Council of Atlantic University Libraries. Uh, and it's my pleasure today to welcome you all to this call CBUA webinar, Text Analysis Tasting Menu, a sampling of available tools, which is brought to you by the call CBUA uh, Collections Committee. Uh, our presenters today are uh, Kara Handron, who is the data librarian at the Map and Data Library at the University of Toronto, and Nick Field, who is a reference specialist at the Map and Data Library at U of T as well. Uh, we are also joined by Kelly Schultz, who is the data visualization library at librarian, excuse me, at the Map and Data Library at the U of T, who will be helping out uh, in case there are any questions that are more in her bailiwick. Um, so a few housekeeping things uh, per past practice. We are recording this webinar um, and it will be posted along with the slides to the call webinars page uh, shortly after the presentation. I put the link to the webinars page in the chat. Um, you'll be directly notified as well once the slides and recording are available. Um, I ask that you please turn off your video unless you're speaking to optimize the, uh, the webinar experience for our attendees in low bandwidth areas. I also ask that you remain muted for the webinar unless you are asking a question. Um, for those of you who need it, uh, you can also turn on live captioning by clicking on the three dots either at the top menu or the bottom depending on your interface uh, and just clicking on the turn on live captions. Uh, following the presentation, there'll be time for Q&A, but if you have questions, please feel free to put them into the chat during the session. We'll be monitoring those and gathering those. Um, if there are any that might need an immediate response, just because they're specific to where we're at, like a technical thing, uh, we can we will be doing that, but otherwise we'll try to save our questions for the uh, after the pre presentation. Um, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the Council of Atlantic University Libraries, Conseil des Bibliothèques Universitaires d'Atlantique, uh, call CBUA, represents member libraries across the region, all of whom sit on the unceded and traditional territories of First Peoples. Uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador, our libraries sit on the homelands of the Inuit of Nunatsivut and Nunukavut, uh, the Inu of Natasinan, uh, the Biotic and the Mi'kmaq peoples. Uh, in Prince Edward Island in Nova Scotia, we find our friends and colleagues situated on the territory of the Mi'kmaq. And in New Brunswick, libraries are found on the land of the Ulustbiak, uh, Mi'kmaq and Passamaquoddy peoples. Uh, we at Call CBUA wish to express our sincerest gratitude to the first peoples who share their ancestral homelands with us all. Um, so without further ado, I will turn the meeting over or the webinar over to Kara and Nick. Um, so take it away. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Let me just share my screen. All right, there we go. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our workshop, Text Analysis Tasting Menu, uh, Sampling of Available Tools. And thank you, Cynthia, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, so I'd like to begin with the University of Toronto land acknowledgement. Uh, we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Um, so, sorry, just a point too. Uh, Karen and I will keep our uh, sorry our videos on while we're uh, presenting the slides, but once we move to the uh, software demo portion of our presentation, we'll turn off our videos just to prevent any distraction. Uh, so here is our outline for today's workshop. After uh, covering our learning objectives, we'll discuss what we mean when we're talking about text and data mining and text analysis. But the bulk of today's workshop will be overviews of four text analysis platforms uh, that we currently have access to as members of U of T and that I hope might interest some of you as well. As our title hints, today's workshop is not an in-depth demonstration of any one tool, but an introduction to text analysis and a guide to uh, what's available. We'll discuss how to determine which tool or tools might be right for you, and we'll provide lots of resources for further learning, including workshops that do go into further detail about individual tools from U of T. 
Finally, we'll have some time at the end for questions. Uh, in terms of our learning objectives, at the end of this workshop, you'll know what text analysis and text ana and data mining are and how you can generally use them in your research and teaching uh, or when assisting library patrons. You'll also be familiar with text analysis tools available at U of T, including especially four web-based platforms, which we'll demonstrate. Uh, you'll see how we access them, uh, what their capabilities and limitations are, and how to ev evaluate which ones might be best for you. And finally, you'll know where to go for more help on these platforms, including both resources and personal help. Now, before we dive into these various platforms, let's take a moment to clarify our terminology. You may already be familiar with terms like text and data mining, or TDM, and text analysis. You might have also seen them used somewhat interchangeably. Text and data mining is an umbrella term that can be defined as associated methods for identifying patterns within large bodies of text in the case of text mining or data in the case of data mining. Text analysis is used almost, intercha almost interchangeably with uh, text mining. For today's purposes, it specifically refers to uh, extracting machine readable information from unstructured text in order to enable data driven Ah, pardon me, data-driven approaches towards managing content. The key part in this definition is that we're working with unstructured texts, i.e. regular texts that we might see in our daily lives, like books and articles, rather than the various ways that texts can be specially prepared for computerized use. This definition is still quite broad and includes many different kinds of techniques. Today's platforms all specifically do text analysis, but they also variously label themselves as text and data mining, digital humanities, or digital scholarship. Now to provide some concrete examples, here are some of the common techniques that fall under text analysis. So you might look for word frequencies, which uh, are where your computer counts the occurrence of every word or phrase in a collection of texts. These word frequencies are often visualized as bar charts or as word clouds of the most frequent terms. You might use sentiment analysis, where you assign a positive or negative score to emotionally charged words like fantastic or horrible, um, and use that to evaluate the sentiment of a large group of news articles or tweets. You can geographically analyze where your texts are from or the places that they mention. You can create lists of words that commonly appear together using topic modeling, and you can automatically classify all of the nouns in your text as people, places, groups, things, etc., using named entity recognition. These are just a few examples. These techniques rely on a variety of underlying algorithms and computational approaches, and they require different kinds of data. Uh, sorry, different kinds of data preparation. Today, we'll demonstrate some of these techniques, and we're happy to talk about them more in the Q&A period. So today, Kara and I will uh, introduce four tools. I'll begin with Gail's Digital Scholar Lab, and I'll also present Constellate. Then Kara will discuss uh, ProQuest TDM Studio and the Hathi Trust Research Center. She'll close by dis uh, discussing how to decide which tool is right for you. In general, we've ordered them from the most beginner friendly to the most advanced. And there are many text, uh, text analysis tools available online. These are four that uh, specifically are available using U of T's uh, subscriptions. Since we do, sorry, since we could and do teach workshops uh, exclusively on, or sorry, teach whole workshops exclusively on just even one of these tools, uh, we won't have time today to cover them in depth. Instead, we'll give you a brief demo of each, about 10 to 15 minutes each, um, and then link to further resources, tutorials, workshops, and so on, where you can learn more about whichever suits your needs best. Uh, I should also warn you that unlike most of our workshops, today we'll be going too quickly for you to follow along. To save time, we've preloaded a lot of data. Just like on a cooking show where a chef will mix up a batch of cookies and then take out a freshly ba baked batch from the oven. Um, so please sit back, relax, and watch the tools in action. OK, so first up is the Gale Digital Scholar Lab. The Digital Scholar Lab is the most beginner friendly of all the tools that we're going to examine today. It has a point and click interface with no coding required. 
It runs entirely in your internet browser and runs your analyses on Gale servers. You can create collections of texts from Gale primary sources, which are uh, subscriptions to scanned archival documents, and you can also upload your own texts as well. There are several options for cleaning and pre-processing your texts, and you can export your data, your visualizations, and full text. It has a limit of 10,000 uh, texts or documents in a single collection, and unfortunately, it isn't as powerful or as customizable as some of the other tools we'll show today, but it is very approachable and intuitive. So I'd say that the dig Gale Digital Scholar Lab, or DSL, is great for classroom teaching and for exploration. Okay, I'm going to begin the demo now. So um, I'm just going to turn off my video to conserve bandwidth, and we'll go to uh, the Digital Scholar Lab here. So I have a link. It's a shortcut specifically for UFT members, so it's uft.me slash gale, but I'll show you what it looks like when we access it through our library uh, library catalog. So I search for Digital Scholar Lab. It's the first result, I click on it, electronic resource. And then I log in here. It's not entirely obvious this time, but there's actually a two-step login process. Once where I log in with my um, University of Toronto ID, and then secondarily where I log in with either Google, sorry, Google or Outlook. Um, this is because uh, the first university login is simply to show that I have access to it, and then uh, it associates my specific data and collections with my Google account. Um, so it needs it needs both, uh, and uh, I would say that if you have any reservations about privacy, feel free to make a Google account just for this tool, or feel free to ask me about Gail's privacy uh, during the Q&A today. So, the Digital Scholar Lab uses Gale's archival collection. UFT subscribes to them, and you can find a full listing by scrolling down and clicking on See the Available Archives. So each of these is a different collection that UFT has subscribed to, and their content are all available in the Gale Digital Scholar Lab. So to create a collection of texts, uh, you click on Build. And there's two options here, search and upload. I'll show both uh, briefly, but I'm going to begin with search and specifically the advanced search. So here you can search for keywords, uh, filter by author, by year, by archive, and so on. So I'm going to search uh, because we decided that it'd be fun for a tasting menu uh, to have food themes for all of our collections. That's our, all of our demos. I'm going to search for T as a keyword. And I'm going to filter uh, within the years. Oh, sorry, between the years. 1700 and 1750. And I'm going to restrict my uh, language to English. So here you'll get a list of results, um, and you can filter by language, year, various kinds of uh, publications, and so on. And you can also see the metadata available here on the right, and a brief snippet, as well as an OCR confidence interval. So more in a second. So once you've found some interesting results, you can add them to collections for future cleaning and analysis by checking them off and then clicking on Add to Content Set. So check them off. Click Add to Content Set. You can create a new content set or add it to an existing one. Uh, I've already made a content set, so I won't add it right now. You can also uh, click on individual items to uh, look at them specifically. So let me just scroll down. There's an interesting one, the case of the dealers in T. Let's say I'm interested. I want to know more about this before I add it to my collection. Uh, so here we have the scan of the original document. My keywords are highlighted. I have a variety of image manipulation tools, such as uh, brightness, contrast, I can invert. And then I also get um, the OCR text. 
on the side. So um, this text was produced automatically through a process called optical character recognition or OCR, which takes images of texts and then guesses what each character stands for. So it's automated and it's much faster than a human can work, but it's not perfect. So that so this OCR confidence uh, uh, percentage here represents Gale's estimate of how accurate their OCR algorithm was. So you can add these one on one to your content sets, or as you saw with uh, the search results, you can add several all at once. You can also upload your own texts. So if you go to build, there's the option to upload. Um, from the build text. From this build page, you have several options involving uploading. You can drag individual texts as .txt files. So let me show you. So you should see my window here. I have uh, some folders and I have a, a file. It's the book of T. It's uh, a .txt text file and I just drag it and drop. And it automatically uploads. I can check it off and add to a content set, say this one about T. Um, you can also add metadata individually or in bulk, and you can bulk upload hundreds or even thousands of, of texts all at once. So normally you might spend hours running searches, refining your terms, and mixing and matching archival sources and the text you've uploaded. To save time, I'm just going to use this sample collection called Civility and Food 1650 to 1800, which focuses on how tea, which was a new beverage in Britain during this time, was connected to social class, medicine, trade, and literature. So after building your content, uh, sorry, after building a collection, then you clean it. Let's click on clean. The DSL allows you to create customized configurations for use with different collections and different tools. So let me show you a cleaning configuring, sorry, a cleaning configuration I've already established. Drop down and early modern T. Okay, so you can see a variety of parameters. So here I've set everything to be lowercase, um, since some of the tools are case sensitive, and you can remove numbers, punctuation, and clean up the white space in very various ways. You can replace words, as I've done here. Um, which was a way of handling the multiple spellings of the word T in these documents. So te, cha, chai, I all replace with T for the purposes of analysis. As I mentioned before, you can save multiple configurations. So you can save as, you can duplicate, you can download uh, spreadsheets that list information about how each configuration was set up for reproducibility. And you can also add stop words. So stop words over here uh, are common words like uh, the, of, and that you can remove from your texts. So removing these texts, these commonly occurring words in English or another language, allow your analyses to tell you about words specific to your collection. Uh, I'm just using the default version here, but you can pick from a large variety of languages. And as I mentioned before, you can save multiple cleaning configurations and export them for reproducibility. When you're done, you're ready to analyze. So the DSL has six tools. You can add them by clicking. Oh, yeah, so you can add them by uh, clicking on an add tool button here up here and you can remove them using the same. There. Uh, I should also say that you can run each tool with different settings, so allow, it allows for a lot of customization. Each tool also uses open source code or scripts, and the DSL adds a user-friendly interface on top of that. So just quickly de uh, uh, describing what each of these tools does, document clustering takes a bird's eye view of your collection, showing how similar your texts are to each other in terms of their length, structure, and vocabulary. Named entity recognition, tags all of the nouns in your collection as places, people, groups, things, dates, etc., and allows you to see in which documents they appear. Uh, n-grams refers to the word or phrase frequency, which are then visualized as your choice of either a horizontal bar graph or a word cloud here. 
the parts of speech tagger is used for stylometric analysis, comparing how different authors use the different parts of language, i.e. proper nouns, verbs, adjectives, etc. Sentiment analysis scores emotionally charged words like great or awful in your text, graphing how the average sentiment of your collection changes over time. And finally, topic modeling looks in your collection for topics, which are distinct groups of words that occur together. Let's try that one. So I'm going to click on new setup. And I want to say that you can have multiple settings for each tool within the Gale Digital Scholar Lab. And the available parameters that you can modify for each tool are also different depending on each tool. So here I can decide how many topics I want. Let's say 20. Uh, how many words per topic? Let's leave that at 10. How many times I want the tool to cycle in the background before giving my, me my results? Let's leave that at 100. Sorry, 1000. And we can also set a cleaning configuration. So I'm going to pick early modern T. And I can run. Now, this tool takes a couple minutes, but just to save time, I'm going to go back and show you uh, the preloaded completed version. So this is the same setups. I just did it a few weeks ago. Great. So um, there's two components. So here actually on the left, here on the left we have a list of topics. Uh, by default, they're just named like topic zero, topic one, topic two, but you can click on each one. Uh, you can rename them, which is what I've done. You get some summary statistics about that particular topic, and you see the top uh, terms, how often they appear, what documents they appear in, uh, and, and so forth. And so I use that as a basis for naming several of these topics. Just using my own judgment, just seeing this top list of, of words. And then you can go to the topic proportion view. And then you see the topic breakdown both for the complete content set. So it has a mixture of medicine and health, ballads, some nonfiction, some things which I believe are OCR uh, errors, high society, steeping and brewing, the virtues of tea, imports, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you can also see the breakdown for specific texts. So the virtues of British herbs with history, description, blah, 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 is a lot more about medicine and health and about imports, whereas other texts have very different proportions, as you can see from the color-coded bands here. So in addition to uh, producing these visualizations and this data, you can also export them. So for every tool, you can click on download and you have access to download the underlying data as a CSV a spreadsheet uh, or as JSON. You can download metadata about the documents themselves, and you can download uh, the images or the visualizations in a variety of image formats. In addition to that, you can also download uh, materials relating to your entire collection. So I'm going to click on my content set. I'm going to navigate to this collection specifically. Pardon, my uh, list is very messy because I also use the Gale Digital Scholar Lab for uh, my uh, current research as well. And so you'll here you get an overview of the various tools, oh, sorry, the various uh, statistics of the of what is in your document set. And then you can click on download. So here you get an option to download uh, either the metadata all 10,000 records in your collection, or up to 5,000 full text items from your collection. And in addition, you can either choose to have no cleaning configuration applied or to apply one of your existing ones. Why would you do this? Well, uh, having no cleaning configuration means that you will have raw texts that are easy for humans to read. Applying a cleaning configuration beforehand, however, means that your data will be pre-processed and cleaned and ready to go if you're using a more powerful tool on your own desktop computer. So to show you what I mean, here's the same collection. I'm going to download raw, original, and I'm opening up the first item here, and there's some OCR issues, but you can see it's mainly human readable. At a court of directors ordered, blah, 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 blah. Now, if I go, I applied the cleaning configuration, look at the exact same collection, and again, you'll see that every single document is a separate text file. Open it up, and it's been it's been cleaned. So it's no longer human readable, but it is ready to pop into analysis into a tool on your uh, desktop machine. 
All right. That's it for our whirlwind tool, tool bah, whirlwind tour of the Gale Digital Scholar Lab. I'm going to move on, but we I'm happy to talk about it more in the Q&A. So the second tool we're going to discuss, oh, pardon me, the second tool we're going to discuss is Constellate. Like the Digital Scholar Lab, it is also browser based. It has access to Portico, JSTOR, and several other databases. Constellate's a little different from the Digital Scholar Lab. Some parts are similar enough, like building a collection, but uh, the analysis is quite different in that it runs entirely in Python scripts. If that sounds intimidating, don't worry. Constellate has many resources for learning Python, which also makes it a great classroom or self-teaching resource, and also has a slightly larger limit, maximum 50,000 records. Let's get started. So, go to Constellate. Org. Log in. I've created a JSTOR account. And oops, <laughs> sorry about that. And in addition, I've paired my account with my institutional access, which gives me access to more of the tools. And that's why you see access provided by the University of Toronto up, up at the top. Um, once you log in, you see this home page here uh, with links to the collection builder up top, as well as tutorials uh, and classes and my dashboard. Now, let me show you how the advanced search works. Click on builder, clear, clear everything, um, and we're at the data set builder. So we can apply various filters here on the left, and then we'll see the visualiza visualizations change dynamically here on the right. So continuing our theme of food and drink, let's say you're interested in reviewing what historians have said about the role that coffee houses played in European social life. So I input the term coffee house, and I filter for specific publication years, let's say 1980 to 2000. And I specify English. And I can pick specific disciplines, as well as uh, particular uh, providers. I'm going to stick with all of them, but maybe I want arts and history, philosophy, political science, social science. And we'll see. You'll see that all of these visualiza visualizations here have automatically changed. We can see the number of documents per year. We can see their key phrases. We can see. Uh, we can adjust uh, term frequencies. There's currently a glitch with this visualization, unfortunately. Um, so it it the the year starts at 1900, but uh, Ithaca is aware of this and currently working on it. Um, so here, for example, I might choose to look at say coffee house and salon culture, and I know that the topic of the public sphere or the theory that theory was very popular at that time, and I can see their relative predominance over time. If I'm interested in a particular visualization. I can click on these three uh, dots here, and I can save it as an image. I can download the data as a CSV. I can share it. I can embed it, and so forth. Once we're satisfied with our results, we click on Build. Create a nickname for your, your collection. It takes a little while because Constellate is gathering all of the collections in the background and uh, assembling their metadata. Fortunately, I've pre-baked it here. Uh, so I want to show you here, if I click on download, I have access to, I can download the sampled metadata, sampled metadata uh, n-grams. Grams are uh, phrases uh, n words long, um, and full text, JSON-L. And if I go to more download options, there's even more options. So I can download uh, data up to the full collection of 50,000, uh, as well as, as request uh, unigrams, bigrams, and trigrams, which are one, two, and three word phrases. And just before I uh, show you one of Constellate tools, I'd like to show you one of Constellate's great teaching resources, 
which are uh, the classes and tutorials. So I click on those and I get a long list of tutorials which cover several text analysis tools all in Python. They're intended to provide the absolute beginner with necessary training, plus provide customizable sample scripts for more advanced users. So if you click on one like pandas, it uh, has a description of the prerequisites and it has a Python script, but especially if you click on open and constellate lab, it will open what's called a Jupyter notebook. So if you're new to Jupyter notebooks, they're Python scripting environments that run in a browser. And sorry, while I wait for that, let me just prep something else too. So if you go to Coffee House and Public Sphere, you can open up, you can open it up as a Jupyter notebook. So you can go both from classes and tutorials as well as directly from Analyze. I will just get that cooking in the background while I describe this. So if you're new to Jupyter Notebooks, they're Python scripting environments that run in a browser. They're broken up into cells, which have either text or code. And you can run the cells with code either by, oh, this one's taking a little while. Let me just see if it, if I refresh, we'll get it going. There we go. Sorry, just hung for a moment. So they provide a description. Some cells have text that describe things. And then other texts, oh, sorry, other cells have uh, code in them. So you can either click on this run button here, or you can hold shift and hit enter. And in case you're new to Jupyter Notebooks, with, uh, with cells that you haven't run, the square brackets are empty. If you've run them, there will be a number. And if they're in the process of running, then there will be an asterisk. Um, for the most part, unless we specifically ask a cell to print text or to produce an image, we won't see any results. So here it just silently ran in the background and was completed. And that's fine. It usually if you're not asking it to print uh, text or produce an image, then you will only see text appear if there is an error. Uh, and I also want to just demonstrate that it's very simple to modify the code. So here we're feeding it a sample list of some data and it's very easy for me to just modify it, rerun it, and in a second, it is is modifiable. So it's very, uh, very modifiable. It's very useful for teaching because they have a lot of documentation here. I'm not going to go through this one in depth, but they describe what every line of code does, what every cell does, and they have a large number of uh, teaching resources. So let's go back to this topic modeling one. And so topic modeling, I picked this one specifically because it has many of the same, uh, it, it's the same tool, and in fact, it uses the same algorithm, uh, LDA, as the topic modeling tool in the Digital Scholar Lab. But here, you can see it running uh, in Python as opposed to through a graphical user interface. Uh, they provide a description of what topic modeling is. They provide some links to the specific uh, algorithm that they use, and then they allow you to import your data set. So you see it's, it's ours, it's been highlighted in yellow, Every data set has a unique ID. Uh, they provide, in addition to loading the data, they provide various ways of, of cleaning and pre-processing. So there isn't necessarily a separate cleaning uh, step, though well, there can be. Uh, so there's a pre-processing um, cell here. There's a separate tutorial for, for sort of filtering, a separate customizable uh, tutorial for pre-processing and filtering your data. If we did that, then there would be a customized CSV here. Uh, similarly, just like with Digital Scholar Lab, we can modify, we can create a stop word list, we can modify it. It also looks here for if we've done that. And you can see here a list of the stop words that have been produced. Um, then it provides a lot more sort of customization in terms of uh, various parameters and so forth that can be run here in Python as opposed to the Digital Scholar Lab. And then it begins creating a, a model. And you can see here it has the asterisk here uh, and is busy uh, running this particular model. It's just finished. And here we go. It lists, just like with um, the Digital Scholar Lab, you can see a list of the topics here, various topics as well as their words. And 
voila, this is something I think is really cool. It has a, a different kind of interact uh, um, interactive visualization than the one in the Digital Scholar Lab. So here, uh, each topic is represented by a circle. Um, their, their proximity and their overlap shows how close those topics are to each other and how much they overlap. You can see an interactive list of topics appear on the right. And you can also uh, export this as an HTML file separately, and so you can load it into your website somewhere. So I think this is a great way to visualize topic modeling, and I think that it's it's very interesting to see how much sort of maybe more learning is required to uh, do topic modeling in Constellate, but also how much more uh, flexibility and power you have in terms of running that tool here. Okay, so that's Constellate. We just finished the Gale Digital Scholar Lab before. Now, please hold on a moment while I stop sharing my screen and hold hand over the reins to Kara. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nick, for those wonderful uh, walkthroughs for Gale Digital Scholar and ProQuest, uh, sorry, and uh, Consulate. Now I'm going to be talking about two other tools. I'm going to be talking about ProQuest, uh, TDM Studio, and the Hathi Trust. It's really almost four tools um, because each tool has two separate components. So I'm going to start by talking about ProQuest TDM Studio, which is a web platform for running uh, text analysis on thousands of ProQuest databases and data sets. It has two components, visualizations, which is a point and click interface with data visualizations and Workbench, which is a much more powerful tool that allows for coding with either R or Python in a uh, Jupyter Notebooks virtual machine environment. And before I get started, I just wanna note that similar to Constellate, ProQuest is not just focused on research, but also on teaching and learning. They very much encourage use of their tools within the classroom, and they have a lot of example Python scripts and documentation to get started. And there's also no expiry date on any of the projects or the Workbench accounts. So any environment you were to set up, which would include data or customized notebooks, uh, would be preserved indefinitely for reuse. So just give me a moment here and I'm gonna share my screen. All right, and we'll get started with the ProQuest TDM Studio. Just one second here. I think I unshared. All right, ProQuest TDM Studio. So get starting with visualizations. So visualizations is a point and click uh, tool for conducting text analysis on a subset of ProQuest collections that are licensed by your university. So in this case, the collection is licensed by the University of Toronto. Right now, uh, visualizations includes all of ProQuest's uh, global news stream collection, which is popular newspapers like the New York Times going back to the 1980s, as well as their dissertation and theses database. They are planning to add more databases over the next year, and that will be based on demand. Uh, visualizations uses ProQuest service for processing, and it's a point and click tool. So absolutely no coding is required. Unfortunately, that does mean that no customization of the algorithms is really uh, provided for. You can create data sets of up to 10,000 records, and you can run up to five different projects at a time. It allows you to perform topic modeling, geographic, an geographic analysis, or sentiment analysis, and to export your results as a CSV or as a GeoJSON file. So I'm gonna get started now with the demo. So this is the first time you've logged in to TDM Studio. You will have to create an account. This is a separate login. It would not be your university ID and a password, and it's very important that you create this account using your university email because this ensures that you have access to all of your university subscribed collections. So you have to click here to create an account and sign up using your university email. Once you've subscribed, um, you'll be able to log in and you'll be brought to this initial dashboard screen, which shows you a list of your projects. Of course, it's, if this is the first time you've logged in, you don't have any projects. So to get started, you're just gonna click on create a new project. It's gonna ask you which data visualizations you like to create upfront. And you must select at least one method to continue. So I'm gonna say I, wanna, I want all of them and I'm gonna click next to search content and craft my search. Similar to the other tools we've shown, this is a full Boolean search. So I'm gonna say, keeping with the food theme that I'm interested in, 
avocados and, and, you know, their popularity in terms of recipes and newspaper articles. It's something that's people talked about it becoming much more popular after the last 20 years. And maybe I want to explore that a little bit further. So I'm just going to run a quick search for avocado and food because I'm interested in maybe, you know, anything that includes both of those words, maybe recipes or commentaries on the use of avocado as an ingredient or on its own as a food item. So I'm going to click on search. Once that search is run, it's pretty quick. Unlike Constant, you won't see immediate visualizations, although you will see your immediate search results. It's giving me a warning here that uh, I have more than 10,000 documents, which is the limit for visualizations projects, so I need to refine my content further. And it's giving me the list of facets on the left-hand side. So I'm going to say I don't want the dissertations uh, database. I'm really interested in news articles. And then I'm going to limit it a little bit. I'm going to say maybe just 2,000 to the present. And then I'm going to apply that filter and it gets me under the 9000 documents. So I can click next to review my project. I can enter a project name. Something descriptive so you'll be able to recognize it and click on create your project. It's important to note that it can take a couple of hours for your project to be completed. This depends on the size of your data set and the load on their server. So what you'll get is a project submission notification that says it will take a few hours and you can click close. It's usually much quicker than that. I'd say a half an hour, but it can be a bit slower sometimes. And you can say here that you can see here that you cannot currently select this data set. It says selected visualizations are being applied and to check back later. But because this is a bit of a cooking show, I've pre-baked the same search earlier in the week. And I see now that I can select um, the visualizations that I've chosen to run. So I can open geographic, topic modeling, or sentiment. Because Nick did such a great job going over topic modeling already, we're going to try something different. And we're going to open the geographic visualization. So immediately, you see this awesome visualization with bubbles, where each bubble represents a cluster or number of records, in this case, newspaper articles, that the algorithm determined were talking about that location. And this is really what the geographic analysis is doing. And all the behind the scenes details about what libraries and tools and algorithms are going into running these analysis can be found in ProQuest documentation. But for the purposes of this demonstration, it's just important to note that it's trying to determine where, not where an article was written, but what it's writing about. So I can zoom in, and as I zoom in, I can see my clusters disperse. I also have this great little time slider here. So I could change this to say, I, you know, changed my mind. I really only want to see things after 2004. And then if I click on one of these little bubbles, I can see these articles that appear on the side um, that are part of that cluster. I can click on those to view them individually by a ProQuest. Or I can choose to export the data and I can download the data as either a GeoJSON or a CSV. You can also, of course, take a screenshot of this visualization. It's just a quick note that these texts were OCR similar to the other tools we were talking about earlier. So while a search will run on the entire document, you can really only export document metadata. This will be titles, dates, IDs, geographic extents, or take screenshots. The full text is not really accessible to export or manipulate in any way via visualizations. So to really work with the full text or customize further, you'll need to work with Workbench. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the Workbench environment. <clears throat> okay, so TDM Studio Workbench is a much is a very different beast. This is a virtual machine tool that uses both ProQuest and Amazon Web Service servers. It's got four processors, 16 gigabyte RAM, and 100 gigabyte storage by default, which can be upgraded on request from individual users. It allows you to query the majority of your licensed collections. So in the case of the University of Toronto, this is almost 300 databases that include both recent and more deeply historical scholarly publications, primary source texts, as well as extensive recent and older newspaper collections from across the globe. Workbench allows researchers to develop data sets in a browser-based environment of up to 2 million records. So right away, that's way more than with, than with visualizations and then execute queries or analyze the text of publications using either R or Python in a Jupyter Notebook. It also allows you to upload your own texts or scripts or libraries and to collaborate with up to five other Workbench users at a time. And then finally, it allows you to export derivative visualizations and data with a cap of up to 15 megabytes per week. 
So if I go back to my uh, TDM studio, Okay, so when you first create a, a TDM Studio account, you'll only see the option for the visualization dashboard up top. You actually need to request a Workbench account as a secondary step using your new ProQuest credentials. And you would just do this by completing a web, web form that was specific to your institution if you were a subscriber. So once that account is approved, it usually only takes a day or so, um, you'll then see the option to toggle to your Workbench dashboard. And just a quick note that by default, uh, the Workbench team will also reach out to all new users with a free 30 minute introduction section, introductory session, um, which is very helpful to get help people get started. And they also have a pretty good and very detailed manuals within the virtual machine that I'll reference in this demo that are also great for helping people to get started. So I've toggled to my Workbench. And if you, you know, this is new, you won't have a, any sort of a search here. And it's the same as with visualizations in that you get started by clicking create a new data set. In this case, you can either select publication titles for individual journals, or you can select individual ProQuest databases. I'm going to select databases. It's just important to note that this is a completely separate tool from visualizations. So if you've already created a project in visualizations, you cannot import that into Workbench. You'll need to rerun that search in Workbench. And that does make a lot of sense in the sense that the content in Workbench is much more extensive. So you are going to get many more search results. So I'm going to filter my database and I'm going to actually stick with global news stream just because that's what we were using in the past. So it's familiar to us and I'm going to click search content and it's the same as before. I'm going to do something similar. Um, this time I'm going to search for cake and recipes. So maybe I'm interested in seeing which cake ingredients have become, which cake recipes have become more popular, um, you know, over the last 20 years is angel food cake declining in popularity, that type of thing. So I'm going to click cake and recipe, and I'm going to run that search. So it's giving me 250,000 documents. It's not giving me an error because that's well within the 2 million uh, record limit cap here. Once again, there's facets that I can refine my results to. So I'm going to say that I want to limit this. Um, I just want newspapers. I'm going to apply the filter there. Um, 225,000 documents. I'm not going to really apply any more filters because I want to get as comprehensive a, a set as possible. And then I'm just going to click review data set. It's going to ask me for a name. So I'm going to click in a name and it's going to ask me just for a description, which is optional, and then say create data set. It's the same thing. I'm going to get a submission successful. If I close, it's going to take me back to my dashboard. And the status you'll see when this pops up, it's going to be in process. So the data set can actually take quite a while to be created. And it's not just the size of the documents. So you see this little in progress bar here. What it's doing is it's actually gathering all of that data that you requested on ProQuest servers. And then in the background, it's transferring it to Amazon Web Service servers, which is where the virtual machine is hosted. So it can take a while and it won't be available for you to manipulate in Jupyter within ProQuest virtual machine until all of that information, all that, that data is available in uh, the Amazon Web Service servers. So it can take a few hours. So I've kind of done this one already in advance, so it's here. Uh, I had created a date range for this one, which is why there's a little bit of a different document count. But I can click Open Jupyter Notebook to start working with my data set. If this is the first time you've logged in, you'll need to toggle your environment on, which can take about 10 minutes as well. Um, or if you haven't been logged in for a while, it might have disconnected. So just an initial step to get started. So I'm going to click Open Jupyter Notebook. It's just going to take a minute or so. And I'll give you a very brief overview of kind of the, the structure and kind of the capabilities within this virtual machine environment. So I have a few folders here. Um, the data folder is where my uh, data is actually stored. I recommend not clicking on this. Um, it will freeze trying to display a very long list of XML files, which will prompt you to have to restart. There is terminal access here. So if you'd like to view a file list, Using, you can use you can do that or read individual um, XML files using Linux commands. But I'm going to go back here. Um, so they have this great getting started guide, which includes manuals and samples. So manuals include things like guides for you know common XML tags, how to select content, uh, export instructions, how to get your data out once you're done working with it. And then if you go back, there's this uh, samples, which include a bunch of sampled uh, Python scripts that can help get you started, very similar to what Constellate 
uh, had done. They are working on sample scripts in R as well, and those should be in development um, and available sometime during the summer. My home folder is a little bit messier, just ignore that. Uh, what's happening is that they're in the process of getting rid and re of some old folders and restructuring some things, but for users who have old Workbench accounts, um, the deprecated folders aren't going to be removed for a while because some research groups are still relying on those older scripts for processing. But if you were to create a new Workbench account at this point, you would just see data and getting started, and that would be it. So it would be much more cleaner to look at. Of course, you're not limited to any of those sample scripts as well. You could go ahead and create your own notebooks in Python or R to run whatever analysis you'd like. It's extremely customizable. The samples are just designed for you to be able to quickly modify to help you get up and running. When you create a new Jupyter Notebook, there's a few options here. There's R or Python, which are just completely clean environments that are working with either R or Python programming language. There's no libraries preloaded in there. Or there's the Sample Environments 1.1, which is preloaded with a lot of common Python libraries that are used for text analysis, and Sample Environment R, which is preloaded with a lot of R libraries similar, um, or R modules that would be used for text analysis as well. So I'm going to just quickly run through one of these sample scripts that I ran earlier just to save time as well. Um, so this is an ngram viewer script. So what it's doing is, so ngrams meaning frequency counts where n is the number of words like unigrams, bigrams. So what it's doing is we're going to select at particular ngrams that we're looking for, and it's going to chart those for us over time. So I won't go through this in detail as well, but what it's doing here, it's importing all the required libraries that we're going to need um, for example, Beautiful Soup for parsing the XML or Spacey, which is a library for uh, natural language processing in Python. And it's going to ask us to set our keywords. In this case, I'm setting Angel, Flower, Lesson, Sponge. Those are the cakes I'm interested in. And it's going to ask us to select our data set. So it's going to have the data. This would be blank. And then you would just populate that with the name of your data set. It's going to pull all the articles into us for a list for us to use. Um, then it's going to uh, essentially sort, do an initial sort of the articles initially um, and print each one as it successfully runs through it. It would give you an error if it wasn't able to process that XML. I'm not seeing anything here. Converting those to a data frame, it's giving us a quick way to verify the data to that this is what, you know, it's doing what we think it should be doing. And then it's going to sort that data frame into three different data frames. Data frames just a, like a, uh, tabular data, like a spreadsheet uh, viewed within a Jupyter Notebook environment. So it's going to sort it into three different categories. So one separate data frame for each keyword, and then it's going to get this, the article, uh, sort the articles by date, essentially. Um, and it's going to give us this uh, term count over exact dates and how many articles are published on that day. And then we're going to resample that to sum it by year. So then we get this cool little graph of, of our first keyword, which I believe was angel and the term counts. And then the next thing I'm just going to do is I just copied those cells and replaced a keyword one with keyword two, and I ran that for the next two keywords. And then I can run this cool little graph at the very end, which is essentially copying all of the key, copying, sorry, comparing all of the keywords against each other. So plotting them against each other. So you get this very brief comparison uh, plot that shows you the occurrence of angel, flowerless, and sponge. Um, in the articles in my data set over the course of, well, you see it starts around 1980. That's when this global news stream database starts to the present. So Angel Food Cake was very popular around 2013. And I mean, this is a very fluffy example, but um, it kind of just gives you a sense of some of the capabilities of, um, of this uh, virtual machine environment. When you're ready to export your data, you go to the manual, export instructions, and it's actually also just a quick little Python script where you just specify the file path and the path prefix and you click run. And essentially it emails a download link to you and it will email that link to all collaborators on your account. And that link, I know it says, it says two hours, that's a typo that they're going to fix. It actually expires in 12 hours. And as I mentioned, it's a max 15 megabyte per week. You can also ask for larger exports on demand. Um, anything larger than that would be subject to review just to make sure you know, you're not exporting any actual full text and, and uh, for copyright compliance purposes. Um, but this could be done by emailing their technical support um, and then they would send the results to you in several batches. So that is a quick overview of ProQuest. And now I'm gonna talk about HathiTrust. So HathiTrust, uh, HTRC or the HathiTrust Research Center, is the research arm of Hathi Trust, which is of course this massive digital library containing millions of titles from institutions all over the world. 
So the HTRC develops tools and resources that enable text or computational analysis of the content in the digital library. This corpus includes over 15 million volumes, which is mostly books and journals, about 3 million of which are in the public domain, and it covers 400 languages and publication dates from 1500 to the present. HTRC has developed a whole suite of tools, the two main ones being algorithms and data capsule, which I'm going to outline today. However, information on other tools is available from the HTRC, and there's also some information on the MDL website as well. So before we get started, I just want to note that unlike the previous tools, the HTRC is much more focused on research and research groups and less so on classroom teaching and learning. So the first of these tools, Algorithm, this is a browser-based tool that uses HathiTrust servers for processing. It's point and click and no coding is required, although like Constellate, it does provide for a little bit of customization of the algorithms. It allows you to query all HathiTrust public domain content, so it's about 3 million, um, 3 million individual uh, documents. And you can analyze work sets of up to 3,000 records and have up to four projects running at a time. It currently allows you to perform topic modeling, named entity recognition, or token count and create a tag cloud. And you can export those results as a CSV or take a screenshot. So to log into the HathiTrust, uh, it's just analytics.hathitrust.org, and you sign in using your institutional credentials. So I'll just sign out and sign back in just to show you what that looks like. You select, sorry, you select your institution, in this case, University of Toronto, click continue, should take you to your university's uh, login page, and then it'll redirect, and you'll see that I'm now logged in, although nothing else visually changes. Once logged in, to analyze data using algorithms, so if I click algorithms, you see the available algorithms that I just mentioned here, but to use these, you first need to create a work set. So if I go to my work sets, um, I see the button here to create a work set, and there's several ways to do this. This a work set's just a project or data set. It's just different terminology for different tools. I can upload a file of volume IDs. I can create a work set from a HathiTrust collection, or I can create a work set using this new beta uh, HTRC Workset Builder. I'm only going to talk about this option today, creating a workset from a collection. However, I'm happy to speak to others later on in the Q&A or, or following. So if I want to import from a HathiTrust collection, I need to have a HathiTrust collection URL, and I can do that by going to the digital library. In the digital library, if you're authenticated by your institutional login, you can create your own collection by searching for items, and clicking on individual items and adding them to a collection, or you could always use an existing collection. So to save time, I'm going to use an existing collection. So I'm going to search for American cookbooks. And there's this great collection called Early American Cookbooks that was created by New York University. So if I click on that collection, I can see all the individual items, 1,458. But what I'm really interested in is this link to the collection, because that's what I'm going to need to pull this collection in as a work set. So I'm just going to copy that. I'm going to go back here, and I'm going to paste it in and click Fetch Collection. And it's going to say success. That was right. It, of course, if you're, you know, there's a typo in your URL, it will tell you pretty quickly. I'm going to give my collection a name, and description is auto-populated if one already existed. And then I'm just going to click Create Work Set. You see this work set becomes automatically available. There's no, there's no delay here at all. And now it's available for me to analyze using algorithms. So if I click on algorithms, and this time I'm going to select uh, token cloud or tag cloud creator. And that's just going to identify the words that occur most often. It's going to remove stop words, identify the remaining words that occur most often, and create a tag cloud visualization of the most frequently occurring words. So I'm going to click execute. It's going to give me a bit more information about how this works. For example, it's only going to look at body. It's not going to look at the header or footer. It's going to remove stop words. It's going to sort the tokens in descending order. And then it's going to ask me for some information. So a job name. So I'm going to say cookbooks to uh, select my work set for analysis. So I'm going to filter for my work sets. I'm going to select my work set. Specify the predominant language. This is helpful in removing stop words. I know it's English, so I'm going to say English. Uh, please point to a list of stop words you'd like to remove. You can upload your own. Same with replacement rules. In this case, I'm just going to use the defaults. I'm going to say lowercase everything beforehand, and I'm going to say that I want 175 tokens max in the visualization, and I'm going to click submit. 
So now you see this under active jobs. It's not completed, it might take a half an hour. So once again, it depends on server load. But I also have this from that I'd previously created, which has already been done. So I'm gonna click on that just to show you what this looks like. So when I click on that, I have a job ID. All of this is just information that would be useful for you if you were to cite this, um, this data set, bring it into a, a, this visualization into a, a project of some sort, a little bit more information, and I get the output. So I have this great little word cloud, which I can open in a separate tab and I can save that, or I could just download a, a CSV of all of the, the words. And I can maybe use that CSV to, you know, maybe put some additional stop words and clean up and, and rerun my analysis if I'd like. So that is a very brief demo of the Hathi Trust. Uh, right now, they only have those three tools available through algorithms, but they are working on adding more. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit more because I wanna have time to go through this because this one is a much more powerful tool and this is the data capsule. So this is also a virtual machine environment that uses HathiTrust servers, very similar to ProQuest in terms of the uh, kind of the, the processing and the, the computing power that you get for each virtual machine. It allows you to query all HathiTrust content. By default, it is public domain, but you can get access to the entire corpus, all, four, all 15 million volumes, um, when you, when you uh, create your data capsule, you just have to sign an additional consent form. It provides for complex analysis using Python in Jupyter environment or via Voyant tools, which I'll talk about a little bit as well. It allows you to upload your own texts, code, or libraries also, similar to Workbench. And it also, similar to Workbench, allows you to collaborate with up to five uh, Hathi Trust research, cent research Center users. So if anyone has an HTRC account, you can add them to your data capsule. It allows you to export visualizations and data up to one megabyte per file. Once again, larger exports are possible on request with an absolute max of 67 megabytes. A quick note that any export requests from the HTRC are subject to, uh, to manual review by an actual person working at HTRC. And this is for copyright protection <coughs> to make sure that you are only exporting derivatives, that you're not exporting anything that could be recognized as full text, like no paragraphs or, or anything like that, or um, OCR data. So if I go back to my HTRC, and this time I'm gonna click on data capsules up top. And this is the first time you're here, you won't have a capsule before, you'll need to click create a capsule, and you'll need to click on a research capsule. It's going to ask you for some information like the title of your project, how much computing power you need, a description of your project. Um, here's the option where you can request a capsule with access to the complete Hathi Trust corpus, and you have to explain why you need that access. Um, so there's a little bit more information, and approval is can take a day or two for this type of uh, capsule. So to save time, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a demo capsule. This is a smaller machine. It essentially has all of the same functionality, other than that is it is limited to public domain content and you can't export anything from it. But otherwise you can play around with it. It's a great way to explore data capsules and see if it might work for you. So I'm gonna select demo capsule. I don't have to do anything. I just have to create capsule and agree to their terms of use and it's instantly approved and instantly created. So you see this one hasn't been started yet. So once created, you'll see that your capsule has a unique ID and it has some status and actions information. Um, it also has an expiry date. So unlike Workbench, capsules expire fairly quickly. Um, they will expire demo capsules in a month if you don't use them. Um, and research capsules, I believe, expire in a year if you don't continue to use them. So you just have to make sure that that stays active if it's something that you're, you know, ongoing, uh, if it's an ongoing research project. Capsules have two modes. They have maintenance mode and they have secure mode. Uh, it's important to be aware of what mode you're in. Maintenance is where you need to be if you're uploading your own data from an outside connection. It allows you to connect by a remote desktop or terminal to your capsule, and it allows you to have an internet connection. However, you'll need to be in secure mode to open and work with any HathiTrust data. Um, by that, I mean to pull in any data via their APIs or to run analysis on any of the data. And in this mode, it is very locked down. You have no internet access, and you can only connect by a remote desktop. Switching between modes can take several minutes. So this capsule that I created earlier this morning, I've already started it and I've switched it to secure mode. By default, they are in maintenance mode so that we can actually demo and work with the data inside of it a little bit. So if I click uh, my capsule ID and then I click connect via remote desktop, which is the only option because I'm in secure mode, 
I'm just going to agree once again to their terms of use. And I get this uh, virtual machine environment pop up, which very much just looks like any desktop you'd, com you'd connect to via a virtual machine. It comes preloaded with a couple of things. It comes preloaded with Jupyter Notebooks, uh, which has common Python libraries. And of course, you can add new libraries uh, while in maintenance mode. It also comes preloaded with Voyant Tools. Voyant Tools, uh, if you haven't used it before, it's this open source web-based application for performing text analysis. It's point and click, but also more customizable. So you can you know, select stop words or, or play with it a little bit more. And there's a long list of tools available on their website if you're interested in more information. So it can create some great visualizations for you as well, um, as well as text analysis uh, tools we've talked about, like word frequencies and topic modeling. It also comes, so that's why on tools, and that's available here through your virtual machine. It also comes with a terminal, of course, and a file system. So in the Hathi Trust, what you'll the only way to really bring data into this is using terminal while in secure mode. So I'm just going to open terminal and I'm just going to create a new terminal to download some data. I'm just going to make sure I'm in my home directory first. I apologize for the smaller screen. It's kind of a screen within a screen here. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this command, which is an HTRC download command. So all of the downloading and manipulating of data via the HTRC APIs within the workbench is done by, via something called the HTRC Workset Toolkit. And this provides a command line interface for interacting with volumes in the HathiTrust digital libraries using their APIs. The data API, the bibliographic API, they have a lot of APIs. You don't need to worry about that. This all comes preloaded in the capsule environment, and you can also run analysis actually via command line in the capsule environment. There's full list of documentation and commands for all of this available via HTRC's website, and we'll definitely share those resources following. So what I'm going to run here is just the HTRC download command, which is, and then I'm going to, I've inputted I'm not sure if we've lost Kara. Oh, you went mute, Kara. You accidentally muted yourself. Oh, I'm so sorry. Where did? <laughs> at what point did I mute myself? <laughs> I'm not quite sure <laughs> what your last words were. Okay. Let's see. Sorry the last about that. Thirty seconds. <laughs> oh, that's not too bad then. I don't know how. That, I must have hit something on the keyboard. Um, okay, so I was just saying that the HTRC Workset Toolkit is something that comes preloaded uh, in all the workbench environments, and it provides a command line interface for interacting with the digital library using their APIs. All of it is it's preloaded, um, and there's very robust documentation about this Workset Toolkit, and we'll definitely share that following. But what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to run, ask you to trust me a little bit that this HTRC download command, what it's doing is it's downloading the requested data via their data API. And the data that I'm requesting to download is that same collection that we were just working with in analytics, I'm sorry, in algorithms. So it's that early American cookbook uh, uh, collection. And this HFC is just an, an additional argument that I'm passing in because I don't want individual uh, OCR pages. I don't want a whole bunch of them. I want one single file for each record. So it's just concatenating as it downloads. Once you download, I'll show you beforehand, everything actually goes, if I open the file system, anything that's secure, uh, that's downloaded while you're in secure mode goes into the secure volume folder. Uh, it's important if you're working in maintenance mode that everything is saved in, that everything is saved um, in secure volume. Otherwise, it's actually going to disappear when you switch between modes. So it's just, don't, don't save anything on your desktop in this machine at all. So if I run this command, I'm just gonna, Click enter, it should start. Okay, so it started the download and you can see a new workset folder has appeared. By default, it'll just go into a folder named workset unless you um, choose run it past an additional argument to change the name of that folder to something else. So because I've done this earlier, I've already downloaded some of this data and I can click in to see these OCR uh, files and open those individually in this workset concat folder. So this is an economic administration cookbook from the University of Chicago Library. As I mentioned, the default file structure that you see if you download, if you don't pass this uh, HFC argument, is you're going to see a folder with each HathiTrust ID. So you'll see a folder with 
the CHI 476. And in that, there'll be individual OCR pages. It's completely up to you if you want the data to be retrieved in that way or to be retrieved in this concatenated way, depending on what you're looking to do. So since we've run a lot of, uh, we've looked at Jupyter quite a lot, I'm gonna show you a quick demo in Voyant. So if I double click on Voyant, it's gonna open this. It's gonna open a browser within a browser. Um, so it's essentially a locally hosted interface that I can interact with. It's gonna ask me to just open, select an existing corpus or upload my documents. So you would just click upload. I'm just showing you this offline because I've already done it to save time, but you would just, this would launch within the virtual machine. You would click upload. You can select that whole folder that you've just downloaded and you can click reveal and it'll take a few minutes and then a new Chrome window will pop up with your results within the virtual machine. So if I go back to the virtual machine, I'm going to open that Chrome window with my Voyant. And here we go. So this is quite a powerful tool. Uh, once it opens, you'll see some visualizations right off the bat. You'll see this awesome word cloud that you can you know, customize and rearrange on the fly. Um, you'll also see this reader of the OCR text and this document count and trends in terms of counts. And you can drill down into this further. If you click on any of these and interact with them, it'll change the view in the reader. It'll change the context and correlations below. So you're seeing keywords and context here where, you know, this I've selected salt. So salt and what occurs before and after salt. Um, you can also look at uh, word correlations in the same way. And you can look with individual, you can drill down within individual documents or you can look at your corpus as a whole. You can also see a summary of your documents here on the bottom left hand corner. So you're seeing this corpus has 264 documents with 26 million words, 218,000 unique words. It's giving you a longest average document length, vocabulary density, average words percentage, most frequent words, distinctive words. You know, this is a baking stuff. So fillets and fish and don't appear too often, neither does dung, but it does appear occasionally. And you can export any of these. So you can. Uh, if you just hover up top near the visualizations, you get these buttons appear so you can export and embed, you can export uh, tools or the data, or you can expect export the visualizations and you would want to save those in your secure volume folder. Once you're ready to export your data, this is also something that you do in command line. So you would just open a new terminal and you would spec you would run a very simple command, which is also available in that documentation that I mentioned earlier that we will send along. And it, the command is just release results. So you just type released results and you add the document uh, name. So if it was results.pdf or results.jpeg, uh, if you'd say this as a JPEG that you wanted to release and then uh, just run a second command that's just the word run and it's going to send that off uh, to the HTRC team to review to make sure, like I said, that it's just derived data. There's no, you know, no, no full text or anything in there. And they're usually pretty quick. So within a day or two, they'd send you a link um, and you would get a link via email to download your data. Similar to Workbench, that link would go to all collaborators on the account and the link would expire in 12 hours. So that is a very quick demo of Workbench. I want to leave time for questions, um, but I just want to quickly go through a couple of comments about choosing the right tool. So I'll try to get through this quickly. Um, so generally what we advise folks is that, um, you know, usually after a workshop like this, people are wondering what next, you know, what tool do I want to spend a bit more time looking into, uh, maybe attend a more dedicated workshops on. So the three questions really are, what are you looking to do? Uh, what derivative products do you need? And do you have collaborators? So under what data, what are you looking to do? Of course, what data is a huge thing? Are you looking to analyze an entire corpus, just selected items? Is it okay if the tool allow, only allows access to public domain content or do you really need access to the entire corpus? And of course, which corpus? Because there is some overlap and a lot of the tools, some of the tools at least do you, allow you to upload your own text, but they do work off separate collections and they're designed to work with separate collections. So that might be a limiting factor. Do you wanna run analysis on full text or the metadata only? So is it important to you to work with databases or data sets that allow for full access to full text content or is it okay to have access really to just metagrams and a sub metadata and a subset of derivatives such as n-grams and based on these how large do you anticipate the data you'll be working with to be if you need to work with a huge subset of the corpus you're likely going to need one of the virtual machine environments for the simple reason that you're going to run up against record limits really quick 
Also, what type of analysis are you looking to do? This is a very simple chart. It is not comprehensive, but of course, very broadly, tools with virtual machine environments are, are more limitless in a sense, um, kind of limited by your knowledge of, of the programming languages that they're using. However, um, point and click tools have a much lower learning curve. So if the analysis you're looking to do is available via a point and click tool and you're OK with running using the presets for these algorithms that often cannot be changed and can sometimes be a bit nebulous, then maybe a point and click tool is for you. But if you want full control over the analysis or you want to run additional algorithms, um, you know, are you willing to put additional time into learning these and learning the programming languages required? Secondly, what derivative products are you looking for? Uh, are you looking just for visualizations, the underlying raw data, or both? And do you need the content to be easily read by humans or only by machines? So it's very different if you're looking to just export some data in a data frame, um, you know, from a data frame in CSV format or create a little visualization to append to a report or paper than if you're looking to really run some additional complex algorithms on this data on your own machine. In that case, it really doesn't matter what it looks like. It's more about the access and the computing power you have at hand. And finally, do you have collaborators? So do you need a collaborative environment? And this can include everything from a uh, you know, an easy way to link shared data sets or collections or a fully collaborative working space. And related to that, do you want your data sets or the environment to be maintained or easily replicable for teaching, learning or research? So some of these products like Constellate are very focused on teaching and learning and have developed researches, resources to support that, whereas others like the HTRC data capsule are more heavily geared towards research groups. On a related vein, some of these will never delete your projects, whereas others projects do expire. So if you're looking to set up an environment you can share, you can share or reuse, for example, in a course year after year, then that's definitely going to be a consideration. So where to go for more help, as mentioned, um, we're going to distribute some resources, including this cheat sheet that we created, which covers absolutely everything that Nick and I touched on today and much more detail on a lot of the products. So it will it's a quick uh, it's a resource to allow you to quickly survey the capabilities of each tool and determine which one you might want to explore further. In terms, this is more UFT specific, but as Nick mentioned, we do do workshops on some of these individual tools. Uh, we often make our recordings available, so please feel free to check those out or look at some of the tutorials that we have. Um, and the test the uh, the link that we will send you with all of the cheat sheet also contains all of those links for uh, resources from UFT, but also platform vendors like training material, sample code, documentation, and vendor led workshops as well. That's just some upcoming workshops at, at the Map and Data Library, which hasn't been updated since we ran this last time, um, but I'm happy to talk more about that. So I wanted to wrap up so we can leave time, some time for questions. So before that, I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for joining us for our tasting menu. Thank you so much, uh, Kara and Nick, uh, for a fantastic overview of several different tools. Um, I must admit, I, I was I am slightly overwhelmed, but uh, but I <laughs> but the nice thing is the recording and slides will be available later for us to uh, to to go back and refresh our memories and 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 get a better sense of what's. Uh, uh, what we might be wanting to focus on. So uh, I'm opening up now to questions. Um, if you want to, you could either put them in the chat or you can uh, unmute and just ask them verbally. Um, so uh, please feel free to start with your questions. Peter was briefly there. <laughs> you there, Peter? <laughs> yeah, I am. Yeah, sure. I'll start off. Um, can you guys talk a little bit about costs? Uh, I mean, I know it's hard because, you know, whatever the U of T is paying for these products will be different for other institutions. I'm Peter Webster from St. Mary's University, by the way. Um, thank you very much for this. It's uh, it's fascinating. Yeah, it is a lot to take in and in a short amount of time. But um, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, any sense of what the most cost effective tools i'm particularly in, interested in you know in in constellate in the constellation uh, you know the jstor tool um you know is, is it more cost effective than the very pricey proquest tool um can you can you give us any guidance on you know how to do this in a cost effective manner i know that we're certainly getting pushback from researchers about the concept that largely this is this is full text that we already own 
and we're now being asked to pay tens of thousands of dollars for tools to work with and analyze full text that we, in most cases, <coughs> have, uh, you know, have uh, perpetual access to. Uh, that's my other question, particularly with the ProQuest tool, is are you, are we only analyzing perpetual access content that you already have, or are you actually looking at licensed content? And I'll, that's enough for me. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Um, I'll quickly answer, answer the second question first because it's more of a quicker answer. Um, for ProQuest, you do have access to almost all licensed content. And the reason that I say almost all, I think it's about 98% now. There are a couple of licenses that ProQuest had signed uh, with providers that haven't been updated to include uh, text analysis or text mining rights. They are actively working on that. Every time a new license is negotiated, they're putting that in essentially as a requirement. So like, for example, at the University of Toronto, we license almost 300 databases and all 300 of those databases are fully accessible to query using Workbench. Um, in terms of the, uh, the cost licensing question, Kelly actually has just put a wonderful link in the chat. Thank you so much, Kelly, which is starting fees for Constellate, um, since you were asking about that one. So it kind of has a sliding scale based on institutional classifications, which are the same classifications used for JSTOR. So it's depending on like your, your, your the size of the institution. Um, I don't know, Kelly, do you want to speak a little bit more about that? I know you've been more closely involved with those with those negotiations with Constellate. Yeah, I'll just add quickly that um, uh, Constellate's really flexible and really um, wants people to try it out. So right now U of T is just in a learn and evaluate trial. So we're not actually paying anything. Um, and I'm sure that if you contacted them, the, the contact information is on that page that I put in the chat. Um, you can you could arrange a trial easily to try it out. And they're also really um, easing people in. So there are prices very transparent on their page. Um, and they're offering discounts in the first and second year to kind of ease you into the costs. Um, and I would say that Consulate, like if I had to choose, I would say Consulate is a great kind of middle of the road. It's got a little bit of point and click, but then it starts to introduce people to using Python and Jupyter Notebooks for text and, and data uh, text analysis. Um, I mean, the limit is on that you're looking at JSTOR material. So, I mean, that's definitely a limitation, but there are ways that you can um, import in your own text to analyze. So I think it's a great kind of intro tool. And I would say that the costs are quite affordable, probably compared to the other tools. I'm not I'm not actually privy to the costs of the other tools. Consulate's the only one that I am aware of, but also they share those fees online. So it's it's nice to kind of get a judgment there. I hope that helps. Yeah, thank you, Kelly. And I just want to add to that that um, a lot of these these tools are are fairly new um, from the vendors themselves, and the vendors are actively working to develop. Um, you know, and they're very much they're very, from our experience, anyways, they've been very responsive and very open to, you know, even just trials. Like if you were to contact them to ask them about a trial, there's there seems to be a lot of drive to, you know, try to get more people on board and willingness to provide, you know, for those trials so that people can and institutions can really try them out. Um, so they've been fairly flexible to date. So it's definitely worth just starting that conversation. I think if there's a one that you're particularly interested in and I absolutely agree that consulate's a great a great middle middle ground um, in terms of the tools we covered today. That's great. Thank you very much. Any other questions, comments? This is your chance. <laughs> and and just uh, if you think of anything later as well, um, we will. Uh, I, I'm sure Kara, Nick, and Kelly will be uh, very happy to entertain any questions that you might think of after the session ends. Um, Thank you for the link, Kara. Absolutely. This is something that we're very much just exploring ourselves. Um, this is something that's been a growth area over the last year. Like in the last six months, I'd say it's exploded um, in terms of the, the questions that we're getting and you know the, the opportunities to try out different tools that are, are being presented to us. So um, it's very much a growth area. We're very much in the learning and exploring phase ourselves. So we'd love to hear about um, you know, what other folks are doing and maybe 
maintain this national collaboration because it's great to hear about others' experiences. It's, it's just not possible for one group of, of people at any institution, even at a, a larger institution like U of T, to really have a chance to, to try out and explore all of the tools that are under the TDM umbrella. So we're very happy to, to have been invited today and to keep this conversation going as well. Thank you, Kara. Uh, Chelsea, you have your hand up. Uh, I'm not sure if you're muted, but we're not hearing okay. Chelsea. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, um, this this can be fielded by any of you. My question is more about how this is playing out within the institution. So, how do U of T Library Services facilitate this product within the institution? Like. Do you find that this is more geared towards research departments or is there more of an uptake from library staff or more faculty? Like um, basically who's playing with it and how? <laughs> Do you want that me was to multi, That was a multi, multi, many <laughs> questions in one maybe, but yes, anybody, anybody can go for it. <laughs> oh, I've talked enough, <laughs> no, but I'm happy to, but whoever wants to get started with that one. <laughs> We'll probably all answer bits and pieces of that, but let me just um, uh, throw in a bit. So in terms of U of T libraries facilitation of this, um, so you, you saw that there's lots of resources provided by the, the providers themselves, and then we're producing things like tutorials and, and customized workshops and um, meeting one on one with with patrons for consultations about these tools sometimes, um, as, as well as sort of providing guides to like how to access this with U of T permissions and things like that. Um, so, you know, so it's it's kind of a mix of like materials from the providers and ourselves. Um, uh, well, the other question is, oh yeah, who is who is using it? It it differs by tools, and I must say that some providers seem more transparent about that that data than than others. Um, I think again, Constellate was pretty good, although I think I might have to defer to you, Kelly, about uh, the details of 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 that. Um, yeah, actually, maybe I'll just hand it over to you at this point, Kelly, if I may. Yeah, no worries. I mean, I think I think definitely like um, some humanities researchers, especially and social science researchers are quite interested in these kind of tools. But what I what I actually wanted to say is that some of like you know, Nick and Kara have, you know, given you a wonderful presentation on our text analysis tools, but that's only one piece of TDM, as they said so themselves. So we have researchers asking us about kind of more data mining as well. That's a whole other section. They might be more looking at like citation analysis and bibliometrics, and they want to look at, um, other data sets that we provide. Um, we uh, license the Linguistics Data Consortium data sets, so we have those for data mining. We have the Web of Science metadata um, that a lot of researchers also contact us to, um, to mine. So there's a lot of pieces to this. I'll put just a link quick in the chat that it's kind of our overview. So we help people even like with APIs, like it's not just these four tools. There's quite a lot going on. And as Kara said, it's all really exploded in the last, I would say the last year that I've, whoops, my lights have gone on. Um, <laughs> that, uh, um, it's really exploded in the last year. So there's a lot of different pieces. That page that I put a link to in the chat might give you kind of an overview. Um, these are great tools to get started with if you're not sure where to begin in the TDM landscape, but there's a lot of different aspects as well. I hope that answers that question. It does. So I guess to further what Nick you had mentioned was that some companies are more transparent with user information. That was something that I didn't even consider. So is there particular products that offer maybe what you would say like the best um, sort of information on your users trends or are you kind of keeping track of that anecdotally? That, yeah, I mean, that's not something that we've, like all of these are fairly new, right? So it's not something that we've really kind of started to dig into. We have more like, we more just like ask them, we have numbers of how many people, like we know through consulate that there's X number of people and there's, that's growing. Same with ProQuest TDM Studio, you know, every month they say like, oh, so many new people signed up for, for a TDM Studio Workbench account, like that that type of a thing. So we haven't asked them for more 
more granular information. I'm not even sure if that's something that, you know, they, in terms of what people are looking at or, or what, anal I'm sure they know on their end what, you know, analysis, for example, or what algorithms are more frequently being run, but it's not something that we've really looked to to date. We've just, we just know that there is increasing usage and we've seen questions come in through our support, um, you know, for consultations on users who are in, for researchers all over the university who are interested in this type of thing. So, um, but yeah, that's a good question. It's something that we should maybe think about in future as well. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Uh, thank you, Chelsea. Uh, we're at 2.30 now, well, actually 2.31, so uh, we come to the end of our workshop time. But if you have, if people have further questions, um, you can either send them to myself or uh, we will, uh, I will provide in some of the information uh, post uh, session, uh, Kara, Nick and Kelly's uh, contact information as well. Uh, but uh, otherwise, I want to thank all three of you, uh, Nick and uh, Kara, for providing such a, a thorough taste, as you say, of text analysis uh, tools out there. Um, I'm sure some of us want to gorge a little more on a few of the ones that you've shown us. Um, but uh, otherwise, uh, I really appreciate you taking your time uh, to, to share with our, our members and also COPO members. Uh, all of this information. It's been fantastic. And thank you, Kelly, for answering, uh, helping with answering some of these questions that we, our members have. Um, and without, with that, uh, we will come to the end of the session and I'll finish doing the recording.